as Victor said, talking about challenging and publishing um, open science benchmark. And uh, I will talk about our recently work as a case study where we published a benchmark for uh, application of machine learning in uh, context of neural image. Near imaging. And so that's why I just to have an overview, starting with background of this benchmark and how to design a benchmark in general, uh, how to create reference uh, results for the comparison of other people that want to test the same task and methods, uh, the publication of the benchmark, and how to reuse the benchmark to exploitation of the benchmark, and in the end, the lesson learned after this experience. So background T1 weighted images are the most used images uh, for uh, thanks to the quality of the image, exploring the morphology of the brain, thanks to high resolution and high contrast between the principal tissue of the brain. Uh, uh, T1 uh, with the images are uh, commonly used for diagnosis, for example, in, for congenital uh, and accurate alteration of the brain. And also they are used in clinical and in neuroscience studies, um, often in combination with other kind of uh, magnetic resonance imaging uh, after several kind of preprocessing and processing to analyze that and retrieve medical information. Um, brain tissue segmentation is one of the critical steps in analyzing processing the MRI images. Uh, actually, the gold standard is to perform the segmentation manually, but for sure, this is very time consuming. Uh, there is a uh, bias from the type of uh, the operator that performs the task and is prone to not much error. So for this reason, um, in the last decades, several automatic model-based tools were developed, most famous FSL, FreeSurfer, SPM, and ANTS. Uh, this kind of tools performs very well in case of healthy subject, producing high quality in, uh, pro uh, results, but may in case of uh, malformation, for example, high distortion of the architecture make and fail. Um, for this reason, uh, in, in a preliminary study, uh, we analyzed these different model-based tools to try to segment. Uh, for example, here there are a mild, you can see mild deformation in case of agency of callosum and eye distortion caused by uh, huge schistes. And we can see that actually a uh, model-based approach seems to quite fail in producing good results, while we also tested a uh, deep learning data-driven method that seems to produce a more realistic results. So for this reason, we wanted to more investigate this um, comparison between model-based and data-driven approaches. And so we wanted to uh, we wanted to put a benchmark for a rigorous and quantitative analysis of uh, the brain tissue segmentation. So uh, what is a benchmark and how we can design this benchmark? Uh, a benchmark is actually composed of five main components. The, the task we want to perform, in this case, tissue segmentation, the evaluation metric, so the metric that we can use to compare the results of different methods in, in perform the task, a data set that we can use to perform the task, a ground truth, so uh, what, what we expect that a task should produce, and a baseline that is a baseline method, so people can use it to uh, refer to it when develop a new method for performing the task. Um, so brain tissue segmentation, we can define it as the parcelation of image in homogeneous non overlapping brain regions. Uh, here is an example where we have five slides of T1 and uh, related segmentation. And usually when we see a segmentation is a encoded in, color encoded image where each tissue has a color. For example, here the white matter is blue, the green matter, the green matter is green, uh, etc. Uh, the other component is uh, um, the evaluation metric. Uh, actually, we use one of the most used evaluation metric for computer vision in case of segmentation, that is the dice score, and actually is the overlap between the estimated mask from the method and the ground truth. Uh, I lost the control. I lost the control. Okay. <laughs> And okay, this is just formally the expression of dice score that is actually two times the intersection over the union of the uh, ground truth mask and the tissue mask. 
Uh, the other component is the data set. Uh, actually, we compose a data set from three different sources of T1 with the images of at least subjects. Uh, two comes from two public um, data set, the CMA and the NAA pediatric. So we have more than 400 healthy T1 with images from CMI, 300 from NAH pediatric, uh, pediatric data set. And also we use more than 200 healthy subjects from Eugenia Medea uh, data set that is uh, in-house that appeared in um, uh, Research Institute, uh, Eugenia Medea in Italy. Uh, this kind of, these uh, images are very heterogeneous as they come from different scanners, have different uh, magnetic static field, and also different type of acquisition, and also difference a lot in the age range between the different sources. Uh, we also uh, collect uh, 37 uh, patients, so distorted brain with different kinds of pathology from the Eugenia Medea. Uh, actually, we have 10 subjects with agency of corpocallosin, that is pathology where we have a partial of complete absence of the corpocallosin. So in this case, the, there is a reorganization of the brain, and usually we have uh, enlargement of the ventricles. Uh, furthermore, uh, we have um, 10 subjects with procedure force and malformation, uh, where actually we have malformation of the burns uh, of the cerebellum and usually the brainstem. And in this case, for example, this is the Joubert syndrome, so we can see the classic tooth uh, sign in the cerebellum in the access lice. Uh, also, we have 10 subjects from the malformation of cortical development that are pathology that affects the gelification of the cortex. So we can have a listen cheerfully when gelification is very low and we have polymicrogyria when we have uh, more gelification than the physiological one. And the, the last category, we have six uh, images that we collect, we collect and call it eye distortion because our several patients with that have um, uh, eye distortion introduced by big schistes or separator sepals. Uh, actually, all the images were underwent the same preprocessing steps, so classic ICPC alignment, so alignment of the imaginary um, line connecting the anterior uh, commissure and posterior commissure, and uh, extraction of brain mask and the correction from my homogeneity of the uh, magnetic field. The other component of the benchmark is the ground truth. Actually, we used as ground truth uh, a six tissue segmentation that is quite a classic way to, to segment the brain. Actually, so we have the cerebral spinal fluid in red, uh, the gray, ma gray matter in green, the white matter in blue, deep gray matter in yellow, brainstem in light blue, and the cerebellum in pink. Uh, actually, after defining the ground truth, then we have to compute the annotation of the data set. As you can imagine, we have more than 900 images, so it's not trivial to annotate all the images. And obviously, annotate, manually annotating is quite possible. So for the healthy subject, we uh, perform the annotation that compose a drain set for future uh, task. Uh, we perform the annotation automatically. As we said before, we have uh, good enough tools that do uh, good uh, tissue segmentation automatically, and we use the Bayesian segmentation method of ends cortical thickness that we noticed in the last um, work that was the best performing segmentation in general. And obviously after doing the annotation, we have to, even if automatically we have to do a quality check and outliers detection to ensure that the quality of the segmentation is good. While for distorted brains, obviously we cannot use automatic segmentation as we see before that performs very bad. So we have to perform at least a semi-automatic segmentation and we implemented an in-house pipeline to do it with uh, some traditional machine learning approach uh, and also a uh, manual refinement by expert operator. Uh, the last part of the benchmark is the baseline. Actually, it's the baseline method that uh, we perform the task and we retreat the, the result to compare. Uh, I don't want to go into the details of the architecture, but uh, just some elements. We we use the 3D unit architecture. 3D unit is actually the um, right now right now backbone of the most of computer vision methods for segmentation. And actually, uh, it's 
a semi-supervised method that use uh, T1 weighted for training and the ground troop to be trained. And actually, it's a data-driven method as um, uh, they produce the results learning from the data itself. So it needs a series of extraction of feature directly from the images to then to perform the inference on the uh, for the output of the segmentation. Okay, after we define our benchmark and we define every steps, we have to produce a reference result as because uh, if someone then wants to perform the same task, needs to have some tables, some image reference to see if they perform better or worse than, than the benchmark itself. So as bench benchmark reference methods, we use a model-based, uh, so ends and uh, data-driven to the unit, as we said before, so our baseline. Um, so we consider ends because uh, the basic method ends. We consider ends because it's the one that showed best performance in the last study. Uh, we can see, for example, in case of uh, ACC per performance very well, even in case of eye distortion has some problems. And uh, actually this is a model-based method because it needs a nonlinear registration between the T1 we want to segment and a template to project the uh, prior information. Uh, in this case, we use anatomical prior for a pediatric atlas, as the, the data, are, as you see before, are actually in the pediatric age. While for data-driven methods, we implemented the 3D UNET using TensorFlow, that is uh, one of the most famous library for deep learning, machine learning, uh, open from Google. And okay, we computed in a dedicated workstation with GPU for sure, or the computation. And then important things, the training set is only composed of healthy subjects. So there is no distortion subject inside. So the learning phase is only computed on healthy. And obviously for data-driven application, we need also further uh, preprocessing. Like in this case, we perform histogram matching because we have a very heterogeneous data set as I said before and we restrict the learning only in the brain mask and also needs uh, isotropic volumes and uh, to scale intensity in same range. Okay, so now defining our uh, reference methods, we have reference results. Uh, here, just to show you some uh, inspection of the results, you can see get for ACC and PFM that you can say they are most easier uh, subject to segment, uh, and say UNET perform quite well, even there are some error in, uh, for example, for ACC in deep query matter and in the center of the um, corpus, uh, where there was corporal housing, so in the absence of third ventricle. While for PFM, also we are very good in the cerebrum, as is not affected by the pathology, but we have some problems in segmenting the cerebellum and the trunk. While in th this is a case of uh, MCDS that also have a uh, huge schistes. So in this case, ENS actually failed in both segmenting cortex y matter, but also the ventricle, while the uh, unit seems to perform uh, pretty well. Uh, main, more meaningful results are for, for example, in the case of eye distortion, we have three examples where we have very huge parasitonic cystis and hydrocephalus. And we can see actually that ANS failed, you know, the comparison. So the model, model based method actually failed, but the, the 3D unit seems to perform well. And but then maybe this is the most important part because actually when someone wants to develop a method and want to compare to a benchmark, needs a table, need data because it needs number. If it's produced number, then you have to see, okay, I perform better than you or worse than you. So for a benchmark, this is the most important part, I guess. And actually the the numbers seems to, to suggest that uh, deep learning, so uh, data driven method is better to perform this task. So maybe people that want to implement their own methods may will choose a data driven approach, so deep learning and not the traditional one, probably. Okay, so after we design uh, the method, we create the data set, ground proof, and uh, everything uh, needs to be published in some way. So for the publication, uh, we, I will talk about data publication, code publication, and in the end, the manuscript. Uh, for the data and code publication, we use um, the platform BrainLife.io, 
the, I don't know if you know this platform, is very useful because um, uh, you can actually uh, publish uh, the data set with the associated DOI and you have um, possibility to store a lot of uh, gigabytes uh, and also you have possibility to be uh, maintained. And this is quite important. And obviously it's a free, it's an open source platform. Uh, furthermore, we published the, the, the code actually on the platform itself because you can actually uh, implement via apps in the uh, inside brain life platform and for the apps you can execute directly using the um, the resource code resources of the that they uh, let you use so if you don't have for example gpus or uh, a course or a workstation made it would be very useful because you can run here and use the resource of the the brain lab uh, let you use but also you can directly download the source code if you want to run locally because every app is connected to a GitHub repository. So in the end, you can also uh, download and use the source code uh, directly in your computer. Uh, okay, so other important things after all this work then is uh, write a manuscript to describe the work and report the results and I'll just publish to, be, to disseminate the work and may let the other use your work and enjoy it. Uh, we published this work in mirror image, in a special issue mirror image was specific for um, uh, a benchmark for uh, a machine learning application in a imaging context. Before, uh, yeah, you know, the <laughs> <laughs> before, yeah, before the, the scandals, okay. <laughs> I want to do that. It was 2022. Uh, it was like, nice. <laughs> uh, Obviously, it's open access, and uh, but in the end, nowadays a lot of journal uh, ask you maybe to publish data to make it in a certain way available, and also ask you to publish the code because more and more uh, top journal wants to be open in general and let and let people to reproduce your results because if you just reproducing your house results, no one can say it's worthless. Okay, and obviously after all this work and publication, we want that someone reuse the benchmark because after the meaning of the benchmark is that someone use it to compare the methods. So the most, the, the I mean the desire that there is an exploitation of the benchmark are reused. And here uh, we I report to you um, an example of reuse of the, this uh, benchmark uh, dataset in. Um, Public challenge was promoted by it for the innovation Trentino, and actually the DDD was used as um, a challenge to try to improve the results of the segmentation in case of malformed brain. Okay, uh, I wish I don't know you do too much, and then I want to let you with a take-home message. So the lesson that I learned from this experience. Um, First thing important is license, license of data and code. Um, because if you remember, I told you that we took image from two sources that was two public sources, for example. And what's up if you take these images is not trivial, straightforward that you can then take and republish because all data in this public underwent an agreement, a license agreement. So maybe you can not republish directly or you cannot use data derivatives. So uh, a care but must be taken when used data, even if it's published and open access from other parts. And also, we published a new data set from Medea, so we had to build uh, a license, an agreement, because we don't want that someone use improperly the data, for example, commercial use, other stuff like that. And also, the code is the same things, because if you use some code that is not public, and may you cannot uh, publish in the app, for example, in BrainLife, because BrainLife app, app is open, so there are some issue and must be take care about this. Another thing is the publishing platform we use Brain Life, but there are a lot of other platforms that let you to to post the, to upload the data. Uh, but then you have to take care how much sites you can uh, upload because it's not limited, obviously. And if is you have to pay or not is long term. If there is the DOI, so. There are these aspects to take into account if they let you to publish also the code and run it 
has brain life or not. So it's not uh, trivial. And obviously, in this case, that we have um, we publish the benchmark. So you need when you publish a benchmark, not just that set. You also need the ground truth to do the comparison. So annotation is important because how to ensure that the, the quality is good. So usually is, there is a manual refinement of the of the uh, ground truth revision from expert, different experts, they may have consensus on the annotation step. So it's very time consuming. Uh, furthermore, a lot of time when you upload uh, a data set on a publishing platform, and in specific in our case, in our case, so neuroscientific platform, uh, you may have to respect some data constraint in the format, for example, bits that later we talk Erika. Uh, so sometimes you have to respect also just for up up upload the data and that to be format in a specific way that is combined to uh, what is required from the community. Obviously, as I said before, quality assurance data must be checked several times because when you publish, you have to ensure that quality is good and there's no corruption and not some errors in data. So this is very important and it's a critical step. And every time some, something is missing, so checking several, several times also different people is, is very important. And other things, for example, in the uh, publication of the work in uh, every image when we did it, uh, we have to take care about reproducibility it was a mandatory step in for publishing the paper that also the code you have to ensure that data uh, that the actually the table that was in the paper the reviewer can click a button and add the same table so reproducibility must be exactly so you cannot just share the code and say okay this works not you have to also to to share the scripts and framework that reproduce exactly what's what you wrote in the paper and actually the last message is uh, we have not to think that you do a lot of work experiments have good results and maybe you write your paper and then automatically you publish and data and code because as we see uh, before there is a lot of steps between this one so uh, be open science is not uh, free of cost in time and and effort <laughs> And okay, in the end, I just want to acknowledge people that collaborate with this work. So actually my lab, uh, Nila, and uh, the Eric Sergio Medea, where we take the data and collaborate also in the processing part, and uh, Pater Brana Fratelli Hospital and Bootsy, where we collaborate with the clinical staff, so the expert of the pediatric and malformed brain. Thanks for the attention. So I think uh, thanks, uh, uh, Gabriele. Thanks also to all uh, in, for for the timing. Um, I'll uh, open the discussion uh, for the for the attendance here in presence, and also for people uh, from uh, uh, the, the online. Uh, uh, so for, for the online participants, they could if you want, if they want, just uh, open their mic. And ask a question, or uh, for example, type the question in the chat. Uh, just uh, act in the way you're more comfortable comfortable with. I start with a question because uh, um, I'm always uh, fascinated about uh, uh, downloading data and reuse it. But I think in this case there was uh, an even more difficult step, which which was collating different. Uh, sources in it uh, and if i miss a passage so uh, my question is very basic one uh, uh, regarding the pre-processing steps so uh, i was wondering whether you um, you visit problems in that step already uh, because for example maybe the formats uh, of the data were not uh, exactly the same uh, with respect to um, throughout the sources so maybe data had uh, different formats or different shapes and the reprocessing somehow failed and this would uh, somehow be reflected uh, in the first uh, step. So my, my, my question is about the uh, reprocessing step uh, after collating the different sources. Uh, 
Okay. Uh, yeah, actually, as I showed before, I don't know if you want to go to the slide. Yeah, uh, I, I can. I can also go with it. Yeah, yeah. You can have the discussion. Uh, uh, yeah. With the slides, uh, as you mentioned, uh, for sure, the data was very heterogeneous. Uh, we had actually. Um, where, where was it? Primo, primo. Um, I think it was the slide. Uh, when talk when we talk about the data sets, just yeah no the other one no not this one the other the other one oh no before before okay this one no yeah okay just <laughs> yeah. okay so as you see yeah that is very heterogeneous data set actually the most um, difference we can see in NIH uh, actually. Uh, less than 4.6 H because actually they have uh, actually the IMEDEA and CMIND, as you can see, are quite similar because they are both 3 dt one with an MPO H, so it's the same sequence. While the NIH use uh, SPGR, and in the case of younger, they use multi uh, multiplied stimulico. So act because they are too young and so they have to, to be more faster for the acquisition. So this is the most I guess things that um, distinguish the, the different uh, data set. Actually, the pre-processing is actually the same because um, all the data are in uh, NIGI data, so an IFT format. Uh, so in the end, they can be processed in the same way as the same format in the end. I think it was not like it was directly uh, an IFT format for all the one. I don't know, maybe Medea would just uh, use the same uh, to, to translate in uh, Nifty. So in the end, it was the same format. But the most things is that the um, high intensity is quite different. Indeed, in, for the deep learning application, we perform a histogram match also to matching the, um, the intensity range because it's quite different. Uh, and also the important things was quality check in general because very young subject, in most of the case, the segmentation failed, so could not be used. So we have to, um to to remove from data sets some subject because it was too much young and and the uh, millionization is different and also the intensity is very different and the automatic tool space actually and it was not possible to use so in this case we have to remove some subject after uh quality check of the data so yeah any other questions any other question uh, because uh, from the presentation of the behavior, I, I, I perceive that the uh, regular benchmark or publishing data is just a one shot uh, task activity. Uh, I would like to remark uh, overall for the season that uh, preparing data set uh, has a lot to do with the versioning of data. And so be prepared that. Uh, and before to arrive at the final publication, you have to be prepared to, to, to intermediate the creation of the data. And even after publication, because if you if the data set is, is of interest, uh, for sure people will notify some mistake uh, or something, and then you have to be prepared to fix and uh, uh, prepare a new release, a new version, so on. I would like to stress the notion of uh, version. Even the, the proper tool to manage that one, not only for the code, but also for the data. We are already in version 1.1, 1 .1, so we have already small revised the, the data set and removed some. Well, I mean, uh, I would because I, I would add something because I have another a further question related to this because uh, uh, I appreciate um, Paolo's comment because uh, I think. Uh, you can here you can see that uh, uh, in open science when when you uh, when approach this kind of task in an open way uh, you move from this kind of like uh, 15th century approach of camera ready papers to a rolling release of uh, sort of contribution to the to the progress of knowledge and i think uh, so this is a feature to some sense the, the key would be to to communicate that uh, this kind of process of building a contribution throughout the years and reviewing the data and so on and so forth, it's what is worth evaluating to, uh, to depict uh, the profile uh, or the impact of a single researcher. But this is another 
uh, story um, because as a matter of fact I was interested in uh, um, a part of your comment when you said that you remove participants so as far as I understood you also wrote down a data descriptor paper uh, so the one published in Brain Life it's a data description paper it's a benchmark description it's paper a description of the bench payer there's the data also yeah so did you document that also uh, uh, the, yeah, the yeah. procedure of data removal because yeah. uh, uh, and I think this is another interesting part of the story. Uh, your criteria for removing the data uh, could be completely different with, for, for uh, uh, it, let's say, uh, other people going for a secondary use of uh, those data sets could, uh, uh, could take a completely different approach. So my point was whether uh, you, you face the, the task of describing how to remove the data and your way to remove the data. Yeah, we use a uh, strategy of outlier detection for, for to check um, outliers in the segmentation of the data. After we check the segmentation, so in, uh, in a rigorous way, we, we check which was outlier, and then we are, uh, visually analyzed all the segmentation that was identified as outlier, and when it was not possible to go ah, Okay, and then we try to correct manually some automatic segmentation that was outlier, but in some case was totally missing the, the meaning of segmentation because uh, the high intensity maybe was too much different from, I mean, was too much different from uh, the distribution of the other physiological brain because it was too much young, for example. So very young, we have to exclude because actually the tool doesn't work and manually, Segmenting was very impossible to perform. So, I have a follow up question. Yeah. Uh, if you use like a, a tool to scan for outliers, what kind of metrics are you using for it? Like, do you have an efficiency measure or uh, because it takes a number? Um, we we check it from if, if I remember well, that's a bit time. Uh, I, I checked for the, this. Uh, I think when it was outlier when it was the volume of the tissue in the same age range. Ah, yeah. When the volume of the tissue in the same age range was very distant from the distribution, I, I identified like outliers, and then I took all the subject and I reviewed. Um, uh, I reviewed, and we reviewed the. Um, one with overlap the image and we see that sometimes and the mistake was actually because the intensity was wrong but yeah it was was not in like in the it was outside the distribution again it was an intensity problem because it was thinking too young and so you cannot perform segmentation in this case maybe there is another benchmark for <laughs> No, no, I was, I was just interested in the metric. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, it was just, yeah, like distribution outlier yeah, yeah, volume. Yeah. volume by age. Yeah, exactly. I think we have time for um, one last comment. We are two or three minutes. So, uh, anyone? I would have just one other comment uh, related to um, the lesson learned, I think. Uh, so you talk about, uh, uh, I don't know if it was in the column of costs or, or something, because uh, I think uh, uh, other than your uh, personal effort, I think you have to involve other people, expert uh, people to, for example, annotate and so on. Um, so my, my question is a more generic one related to uh, the, the jargon or the language you have to speak with uh, people which are not familiar, for example, for, with benchmark, but very familiar, for example, with annotation in order to collate uh, their expertise with this kind of, uh, so was it was that difficult and whether open tools or open, uh, uh, let's say, way of thinking to this data set helped you in doing this? Uh, yeah, it's, it's always difficult to speak with uh, doctor, for example, medical doctor. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, uh, because yeah, they are uh, different, way of view things and obviously they are not into more technical uh, stuff so it's 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 not trivial to interface with them um but in the end if you very and you have to be very specific and actually ask very precise what you want <laughs> and so for example 
in our case, well, the agreed contribution was from the neuroradiologists that had to uh, revise the, the segmentation and highlights when, when there was the, um, something that we could not understand it was wrong or right because you segment some part of the brain and then there is like a gray zone that you don't know if there is something or something else maybe for partial bone effect so also a problem with the data and so you don't I'm not sure what is that if it's good segmented or not and only someone that is an anatomist or neurologist that is into these stuff can say to you, yeah, this is right, this is wrong. So the contribution is very important from experts. They are the only one that can uh, disentangle if the tissue is another another one. And actually, when you have to interface with them, you have to be very specific and ask very specific things. And maybe this is mm -hmm. that, that's the like like the value of the of such a work. Uh trigger uh, like communication with other people because this is something which is really valuable uh, in sense of in sense of like what research open tools and so on this is something that uh, in your experience uh, triggers people or it's more like uh, let's go for a punctual question and skip all the rest no no yeah for sure um is it an interest indeed uh um i i someone asked me also uh, the code uh, and I share it with them and obviously they are interested because is uh, actually even is not like a new revolutionary tool is actually state of the art for segmentation with trade unit but uh, when you uh, okay this is mega a good question when you uh, it, it's not so much important to produce the best method of, of the world but you have you give the other the instrument to use it easily. This is different because uh, computer science approach is to create new outstanding uh, methods that maybe increase of one percent the accuracy, but maybe just publish very complex GitHub repository and sometimes very not useful because it needs one hundred percent, one hundred of one thousand these dependencies and something like that. So it's not possible to reproduce in your computer, for example. So in the end, when someone see that is a tool that you can download and use it more easily, they are more interested than the one that may perform super well, but it's impossible to use sometimes like this. It's a different approach. So for example, someone asked me the, 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 the code tool because it seems like it's public and accessible and you can use it more easily. So sometimes it's better to give something that is easy to use than something that is outstanding, but it's too complex to use. So maybe it's more yes, interesting. Okay. Yes, I see. So if there are no other questions from here or from remote, uh, thanks, Gabriel. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I would like to start by saying thank you to Vittorio for all the work that he did with me and uh, also for this opportunity to present my work. The title of my work is Beats in the Context of Multi-Technic Approach, a TMS, fMRI, and Kinematic Study. So as you probably understand from the title, uh, my aim was... Oh, sorry. The aim of my work was to um, apply a Beats organization on my data set that was multimodal and multi-technique because we did study the, the same group of, of participants, 32 participants, by applying TMS simulation, uh, MRI recordings, and kinematics of behavioral recording. So my aim was double-fold on one side. Uh, we, di we did need uh, uh, to find a way to summarize all these that different data in, a same, in the same matrix, let's say matrix. And on the other side, we would like at one point to share our, this, uh, our data set, also because we would like to propose this multi-technique approach for also for other purposes. Our goal was to study the motor control and the hand movement, but this multimodal multi-technique approach can be used for also different purposes. Just briefly, I, uh, I'm now, I will now introduce you the, my experiment just to make you understand why it was needed to um, transform my data set. 
Uh, each participant performed the experiment in two days. During the first day, we did collect the resting state fMRI data and we did employ uh, TMS stimulation. As a timeline, each participant started with a sham stimulation at the beginning and then performed the two run of resting state inside of the scanner. After that, they did perform active uh, stimulation and also um, underwent a uh, two run of resting state in the scanner after the active stimulation. So let's say that the first run will be pre-stimulation brain activity, and the second two will be the post-stimulation brain activity. In the second day, the same participant performed a, kinemat a kinematic experiment in which they had to perform two different tasks. On one side, we have a, sim a simple grasp reach task. So we ask participants just to reach or grasp a small ball with um, the right or the left hand. In the second uh, uh, task, we did ask the participant to perform different grasping action, and in this case, only with the right hand. And we did collect kinematics data from 22 markers on the right hand of the participant. So the amount of data in this case was really bigger than the previous one. So uh, I will now show you the original data structure. The first part, this is the, the original folder that you usually download from the, directly from the um, DICOM system. As you can see, we had the two uh, resting state functional uh, run prior to the simulation, the field maps that are needed to, for, to perform the preprocessing prior to the simulation. Then we had the two resting state post, the field map for the post, and we acquired also the, st the structure of scan. For the kinematics, the kinematics data, the, the situation was really was, was easier than the fMRI because we had two run in the for the, the first task, so grasp and reach task, because we just asked participants to perform one run with the right hand and one run with the left hand. And for the, the second task, the motor synergy task, we had 10 run for each participant on the right hand. So what I did is uh something like that. This is the this is a template for the first participant. Uh, as you can see from here, now we, we, we did uh, summarize all the information, all the data for each participant in a, a single folder. So we started with, can I point? No, I cannot point, okay. I start with um, uh, uh, the first folder that summarized, that, that contained the um, structural image of each participant. Then the, the film up folder, so with the both pre, or pre and post stimulation film up, the functional scan. Uh, after, uh, and this is the, the first part for the, the fMRI. Then we added a behavioral uh, folder in which we basically described all the uh, TMS protocol that we employed in each participant. So TMS simulation, the type of the simulation, the intensity that was, of course, single subject specific, the point of the simulation that was also single subject specific, and all the characteristics of the TMS protocol. Uh, lastly, we had also a task folder in which we summarized the, um, the behavioral data for acquired from the kinematics experiment. So uh, as you can see from here, uh, the, the work was, was uh, the goal was achieved because we did fi find a way to summarize everything in one folder. I did, uh, I brought um, a really simple MATLAB script to just pick up the data and move it to the new folder and rename all the data. Uh, I hope that in a, in a future room, that data will be uh, available online. Um, thank you. Thanks, Elga. Thanks also for this uh, concise presentation. But it's, it was, at least for me, uh, it was uh, like full of concepts and uh, relevant uh, aspects. I would, uh, uh, okay, I don't want to like uh, monopolize the question and answer session. So if you have questions, please, Gabriel. Yeah. Thanks. Gabriel. So in the end, uh, it, it, it was complex to do everything in the range for these tasks. But in the end, after this work of structuring better the data, you 
to see directly the benefits using, for example, some tools already published that use bits in your in context of your data analysis. I mean, you you structured the data in a correct and good way, so very good. Also for you, so I have more organized in your data. I may run your script and then you can trade your script for the other that runs better and are already mm -hmm. uh, automatic, uh, automatic. But just in your case, you benefit, benefit, uh, you have already see the benefits of structured data using tools that someone already published or? Well, um, uh, at the end was uh, partially, the, the answer is partially because uh, I didn't uh, use this data set uh, in, in a tool uh, um, that uses bits. Uh, but at one point, I I needed to download some AKCP data from the AKCP dataset. So I need to run the same analysis on the fMRI data that I did on my experiment, and my script were already ready for the for the data. So in this sense, yes. So you already see an impact. Yeah, of yeah, yeah. With it, so it's useful. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Follow. Uh, did you approach uh, the proposal to the ethical committee, the plan uh, of uh, publishing data, or uh, you just uh, uh, no? That you are considering now, or are you open? No, uh, <laughs> did you, or did you did you include in the proposal to the ethical committee? Uh, I have to be honest. The project that I'm using, uh, I was already approved uh, when I started the the PhD, so I honestly don't really know the answer. What, what I can tell you is that uh, I didn't check. I'm starting thinking about that. For now, the data are all only on my computer. and I. But I think that if the data are anonymous, can be published. Uh... I'm pretty sure that uh, at least, uh, so if we uh, first consider like uh, all the non-structural fMRI data, so kinematics, which I think it's uh, extremely valuable. Uh, data set because I don't see so much of those data sets online. It's completely anonymizable. Mm -hmm. I think uh, you can uh, you can share it like this. It's uh, it's no big deal. I think in sharing those data, uh, other data we can talk about it. I mean, mm -hmm. I appreciate that in the template uh, in the in the ethical committee uh, document uh, something should have been written down. And mm -hmm. It's a good start. I mean. Good starting point. Thank you. Uh, other questions? Also from remote, if you have questions. Yeah, I have more of a curiosity if I can ask. Um, so I am from a totally different field. Uh, I work with, with animals and neurophys neurophysiology. And, um, you know, in, in, in our field, it's a rather new uh, thing to have an effort to standardize data sets across labs in, in a similar way to, to the bids. Uh, Structure you suggested. I'm curious how widespread it I how widespread it is in your field to to have data organized and shared like you did. Well, uh, we, if you are speaking about neuroimaging, at least for fMRI, I, I think that uh, the, the 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 field is full of people that are now trying to organize everything in bits because, as I I answered before to Gabriele. Is easier because if all the simply if the all the names of the file are the sim are similar, my script can work on my PC, on uh, Victoria's PC, and uh, all the computer. So I think that there is not so much public on it, but we are going to towards an open access uh, data set, at least in neuro in uh, neuroimaging. I did that. No, but I I agree that is. Very, very useful. I was asking, like, if you had to put a percentage on it, uh, what percentage of studies would you say in your field use this sort of standardization? Can you ask me <laughs> with that? I mean, uh, I mean, an estimate. It doesn't I have to be right. I can say to you that, uh, as um, as um, Enrico was saying, uh, the most successful uh, examples of uh, public publicly available data sets, they are strictly uh shared uh, with with a strict uh, uh, bids uh, compliant policy so i don't know i don't have a number i could say that quality data sets uh, which are uh, nowadays available uh, they follow bids uh, bids uh, standardization so uh, i don't know if 
many data sets are shared, but uh, I think the best ones or the ones that many people are using as, for example, starting point for a benchmark or uh, just a baseline uh, or a, um, a comparison, they are in bits. Also, the most successful initiatives in this regard, for example, Open Neuro, uh, they follow a strict uh, uh, data validation uh, with bits compliant principles uh, policy. So uh, maybe uh, there are, you, you cannot really give uh, a huge number of percentage because many people share their data uh, nowadays, especially outside Europe, but uh, the, the most relevant attempt in this regard, they are in bits. And also, uh, I don't know if this uh, answer to, to your question. Maybe it's not an answer, but it's a way to... Yeah, yeah, it, 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 sure, it is an answer, thanks. Yeah, it's interesting. I, and in general, I wonder whether we should strive to unify these formats across fields as well, not just, you know, human um, sort of neuroscience yes. like this one, but also animal neuroscience, because, you know, for comparative studies, it would, would be also useful to agree. Uh, but, you know, this is, of course, a big effort, so... <laughs> We had um, an interesting uh, workshop, actually, the first one this year, which was called uh, Open Tools for Animal Cognition. And uh, there are many people also here from the local community uh, who presented attempts to uh, use bits uh, uh, for animal cognition purposes. So uh, th th that could be a good starting point. Another st good point, and, and this, uh, this would be another comment for Enrica, um, is uh whether you found uh difficult to uh stretch um such um uh, let's say uh, specific or peculiar uh, way of uh, interviewing the brain like kinematics mm -hmm. into the bits because my my <laughs> my point would be to 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 discuss about uh, how modular and versatile could be uh, this standard mm -hmm. Well, uh, honestly, not with the kinematic data. I didn't have any problem with kinematic data, probably because the, the data at the end are numbers, are array of numbers. So basically it was just plotted in the file and put you know, everything together in the file. For me, the, the, the most difficult part was the, the network simulation part. Also because if you open the website, there are all the, the description of that, what you should do, you should not do. But uh, is uh, everything is really uh, clear and specific for MRI and our imaging in general? Behavioral, okay, you can understand from that. But for this part, uh, is something that I think we should we should, and I think that also you with um, yeah. uh, Giacomo, Giacomo, Giacomo <laughs> yeah, that's all, yeah. yeah. Uh, you are you are doing because it's is a is a new is a part that is not usually seen in a bit structure. Yeah. So Enriga uh, is talking about the attempt, oh, because BEATS standard, as the, the, the acronym suggests, it's brain imaging data structure. We can discuss what is brain imaging, uh, because I think uh, at least uh, lesions, they're sometimes included in the famous brain imaging, uh, uh, like uh, resolution and uh, like time re temporal resolution, spatial resolution, mm -hmm. the lesion is, really highly resolved in, uh, in space. Uh, so it's basically a, an imaging technique, some conceptually, uh, but uh, maybe um, non-invasive brain stimulation can be, uh, it's hard to define it as an imaging technique. It's not an imaging technique, uh, but the effort, Giacomo uh, Vertazzoli, which, uh, which is a former PhD student here at uh, CIMEC, uh, I and Marta Bortoletto and Carlo Minucci, together with the BITS community, because there's always a community effort uh, we are trying to do, is to propose a way to standardize the description of uh, uh, NIDS experiments. So um, it's, a, as we were saying uh, with, uh, with Gabriele before, uh, it's, it's, a, um, it's a work in progress. You know? It's a journey towards uh, uh, having uh, um, a solid standard such uh, uh, bits uh, right now, but bits started as a, a spin off on, uh, of the open MRI format itself 10 years ago. So uh, let's see. Nice. Uh, yeah. <laughs> how, how do we see ourselves in 10 years? Maybe uh, the, the bits and IBS uh, would be as established as solid as uh, uh, bits today. 
Um, mm -hmm. I would say that uh, so now 23 is approaching to the end, but uh, uh, Federico uh, and all the people from Alina Cognition community uh, here, if you have ideas for uh, um, meetings and workshops and even like round tables of discussion related to open science, please uh, uh, do not hesitate to write down an email to me because uh, I'm really interested in uh, uh, trying to, to bring uh, ideas from that part of the community to the discussion because as far as you can see, you can attend a presentation which is completely off topic and have uh, ideas about your research as well. So thanks. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm going to be telling you about a project that came up during my master's course um, here at, uh, at CIMIC, uh, run by Professor Yuri Gotzi. Um, this was the course called Brain Development and Disease, which um, it teaches what, what it sounds like it teaches. And uh, the final exam had a format that uh, there was a little bit unique. It was not you know, a list of questions. Um, Instead, Yuri proposed that we implement a lot of the content that we had learned during the course and, uh, and turn that into essentially a mock research paper. So we had to choose a gene of interest and a disease or disorder of interest and uh, try to use open databases out there, particularly on Brain Atlas, OMIM, things like this. And, uh, and then of course do a deep dive into a literature search to try to see how the gene might impact the disorder and uh, and then turn that into sort of a mock research paper and, and try to see how alterations of the gene could have impacts on the, the disease or disorder. And this, this was kind of a fun project and, uh, and I put a lot of work into it. And at the end, he already said to me, all right, well, I think it's really good. Let's actually try to publish it. Uh, and for, for the purposes of the project, I had mostly described things qualitatively um, I had, you know, looked at some looked at some heat maps and things, and and said, okay, well, this more this looks like more, this looks like less. Uh, so, for the purposes of publishing, we uh, we recruited uh, my co-author Eli Reza, who is a wizard of data analysis, and uh, and we added some quantitative description to what I had already qualitatively described, and which did result in an actual publication recently. So we're very happy about that. Um, so this is the general timeline, the whole story, and I'll go ahead and tell you a little bit more about the, the content of the project, give you some more context, but we're, we're excited about this because it, it does, it provides sort of a template for, for this kind of method that can use teaching activities to promote open science and potentially generate new hypotheses. So I chose major depressive disorder as my disorder of interest, um, mostly because it's 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 such a giant giant problem, and there's so much research that goes into it. But at the same time, we uh, there's still a lot we don't know, and in particular with uh, prognosis and treatment outcomes, there is a lot of variability. And uh, I think something like 15% of patients uh, never respond well to treatment. And even those that do, it might be trial and error to get there. So I felt like there was a lot of a lot of room for something new to be discovered here. So I decided to to look into some some genes that could possibly affect this. And uh, very 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 broadly, uh, some of the main mechanisms of pathogenesis for MDD are the systemic and neuroinflammation um, induced by the immune system, which to some extent is a good thing, uh, but there can be too much of that. And that's that's a very common common thing in patients. Um, and then the other one being the dysregulation of the stress management system, HPA axis, and all that. And I found a gene that, in fact, functionally affects both of those things. Um, it in, it is involved in the immune system as well as like basic cellular cellular functions, uh, but also it helps regulate uh, glutocorticoid sensitivity. Um, and there's there's a lot of work on both of those things, and so so I thought this made sense that this seems to correlate with these two major hypotheses of MGD mechanism. So I decided to look into this, and I went to Alan Brain Atlas um, with a couple of these questions in mind um, as just starting points. Like, do do I see a difference um, in the expression of this gene in regions that would be implicated in the disease? And does this change over time if uh, if there are developmental timelines available? So 
this is our overall workflow. Uh, this is one of the figures from the paper. Uh, we go dig around in our brain atlas um, across species if possible, across time if possible. And then uh, Ali Reza wrote his wonderful code that, that takes the data and visualizes it really nicely. Um, and we were able to find, uh, we found data from human and non-human primates um, developmentally. So we have those over time. And for the, uh, for mouse, there was not the developmental data set available for this gene, but we did find a snapshot of the adult mouse just as a, as a picture of where this gene is most strongly expressed in the brain. And you do see a whole lot of this in uh, frontal cortices as well as hippocampus. And those, those are really well known to be implicated in MDD to begin with. Um, and then when it came to development over time, which is part of what I was really interested in, uh, we do see an interesting pattern where the, um, where the expression of the gene is much, much, much stronger in MDD relevant regions, particularly during early life. Um, and you can see it a little better in the human because there are more time points available, uh, but the, the expression of the gene is much higher in regions that are implicit in MDD versus others, and that becomes a little more evened out over time. And this, this was particular, it, it stood out to me because one of, uh, going back to those, those two hypotheses, of uh, pathogenesis, one of them, in fact, they both are implicated in uh, early life stress. And the idea that in early life, this gene is super active in relevant regions also means that it's vulnerable to disruption. So I, I thought there was, there was something exciting there. And uh, well, we got comments from reviewers saying, well, okay, but these are, these are uh, theoretically controlled subjects, right? So we went and uh, looked around in some previously published data and reanalyzed some stuff that was already out there. Many thanks to these authors. Um, and so this, in a, in a mouse model, we, we did find that in a preclinical mouse model of depression, the classic uh, social defeat model, uh, the, we did see an upregulation of this gene in the, in the defeat model um, in prefrontal cortices and hippocampus. And then for a human sample uh, in, in postmortem samples in the prefrontal cortex, we, we also saw a really strong upregulation in the prefrontal cortex uh, of this gene specifically in the disease condition. And so that, that was just to kind of confirm what we had found before <clears throat> and to you know, bring, bring the, uh, the disease into the, into the equation where before it was, it was just purely observational and uh, kind of just a theory. So as far as scientifically, there's only so much we can say about this, right? It, it, is, it is mostly observational, um, but I, I think there is something to it when you look at all of the literature, how uh, this, this gene seems to be involved in the, the right regions at the right time points, as well as it's already functionally known to, to be involved in, uh, in these two hypotheses of MDD pathogenesis. And so the main picture here and what we tried to say in our, uh, in our article that we wrote together is that the, it's not that this scientific story is foolproof. I think it's kind of exciting, but part of our point is that this, this came out of just a class project, right? This was just a final exam. And uh, so we're really excited that this could be something that other teachers could apply in other contexts, in other kinds of classes. Um, to result in new ideas, um, but also for the open science perspective to make use of the data that is out there. There is so much of it, and we should be looking at it in all different ways as much as we can. Um, and it also helps educate students about what is out there, how to use it in a little more of a bioinformatics perspective, which the master's course here doesn't have, so it was nice to get a little bit of a head start there. Um, plus, we've also generated this new code to uh, to analyze and visualize some of this data from Allen Brain Atlas, which is also publicly available. Um, and we do hope that this will lead to similar projects being adopted in uh, in other classes. Thanks. Thanks, Sarah. Uh, any question? Bye. Are you good? Uh, as you know, I'm, I'm not in the field, so just a curiosity. 
I don't know how, how, how deep did you um, investigate the development develop of the, um, the data that you have, but do you, do you think that there is a specific time window in which the, the, the individual is more, could be more affected in the, at one, at some age in which the, 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 the children or the adolescents or the adults will be more affected in the, well, the modification, I assume, of this gene, gene and so mm. the development. Yeah, sure. It's a bit of a broader question about early life stress in general, um, and which I'm not an expert on whatsoever. Uh, but in in this case, I I was looking at anything from from birth to late adolescence, really. That's that's when your brain is changing the most and still being developed. So it's more it's more vulnerable to disruptions. Mm -hmm. And there's a whole body of work out there that I I am not not an expert on. Um, but that that's what I was looking for here. And so so here I I would have for the human anything up to you know I suppose twenty years old and uh, the by the way the the black lines here are uh, connecting what are roughly similar developmental ages between the two species um, and again we're, we are a little limited here just of course based on what Ellen Gray Atlas has um, which over time is going to be different um, and uh, so the the precision here we can only we can only get so good but it. Plus, there, there are not a whole lot of subjects per point here, um, but still, as an exploratory analysis, I, I think, I think it's pretty exciting theoretically. So. Yeah. Um, can I, can I have a comment? Follow up. Go ahead. Comment oh yeah, please. please. You so know more about that than I. Do. Yeah, I mean, I work on early life stress, <laughs> so <laughs> it's more, it's more of a little bit. So the, 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 the difficulty of answering the question is that it is well established, like if every major brain area has its own vulnerability window mm -hmm. during development. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you take an image like this, and this could be, I don't know, an adult animal, but maybe some some regions are at the stage of development that is, you know, fully completed, other are completely far behind. I mean, it's well known in the human line the frontal cortex mm -hmm. takes much more, like a decade more than other years, like almost 20 years more than sensory region. So, it, it's really hard to answer that question, and, and that's one we feel where being like very region specific is still valuable mm -hmm. instead of looking like a broader like uh, connections. So of course, the problem is that you know one region goes to hell, uh, but what happens to the rest of the city? So yeah, it, it's, it's it's a really tough question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, <laughs> it was just a curiosity, just because I, I yeah, sure. I, no, it, it's it's a good point, and and by the merit of what Gabriele said, we are we're limited in in this case when we're talking about uh, such a big disorder as depression. I think uh, we, we might be limited by the region that takes the longest to develop, right? That would define uh, that, that vulnerability period. So in that case, uh, I suppose the prefrontal cortex, right, in, in humans at least would, uh, so yeah, we would be looking up until early adulthood. Okay, thank you. a question also from Ramon. Yes, I, I have a question. I mean, it's obviously a long time since I, um, take a class or give a class for the matter in Italy. And so I was wondering how, how widespread it is, this, this cool approach of, you know, teaching a class and then assign projects or, <clears throat> you know, final exams uh, that are, entail like a critical review or a critical sort of use of open source data sets and literature. Well, personally, yeah. it's first time encountering it so I suppose not very um but I think in uh it's, it's I would imagine it's more common in applied sciences right like engineering um or computer science or something like that so when when I think of examples of something like this that uh like if you're if you're learning coding for example or some particular kind of bioinformatics or data analysis it is much more intuitive to tell your students at the end of the course now go find a data set and and make something out of it um because you are learning those technical skills, right? But for, for our field um, of uh, cognitive sciences, neuroscience, whatever you like, it's it's less common, I suppose, because, because you're not usually specifically learning those technical skills. And so a professor might not think that this is something that is on the table for them. Um, and I think that's part of Yuri's and my point here is that it, it can and should be considered um, just because there is not a, a technical skill or a technical problem to solve doesn't mean that there 
like there, there is still value in, in diving into the literature and looking at data sets that are out there, um, even just from a theoretical point of view. Yeah, I mean, I fully agree. Uh, I, I think, I, I mean, I disagree that there is nothing to, um, I mean, I think that even the more theoretical subjects, you know, need to teach you the scientific methods. And so having you do a project like this is fantastic. And, you know, I, I think I really like the, the presentation for this. And I think we should uh, encourage every every class to be more more like this, even in our subjects where, exactly. where there is less coding involved, you know? Exactly, exactly, yeah. And uh, well, luckily the, the guy who taught this course is now the director of Chimic. So maybe, <laughs> maybe he'll make some changes. <laughs> Yeah, I would also add that uh, um, for PhD students here at CIMAC, we have this kind of like activity um, where you can uh, apply whatever open science concept in, uh, for example, in the case of Enrica, it was exactly sitting on a data set and try to think all the pros and cons and then apply the bizification. Uh, so we, with the, the former CIMAC director, Kalominius, we thought about this, I think four years ago, and there is uh, it's not a class. It's the possibility to earn a credit, one credit for the PhD student uh, um, credit pathway. Um, so it's not teaching techniques, but still it's a possibility to earn a credit by doing open science. It's not exactly what you were saying, but it's still uh, something that relates to your educational uh, uh, path uh, related to open science. And I think uh, in any case, I totally agree with uh, the comments that if Yuri, which is now the director, uh, follow on with also the, 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 the path uh, Carlo Minusi tracked uh, a few mm -hmm. years ago, it's a, it's a very good opportunity for such a center. And if you just think about the presentation we, uh, we attended so far, so something related to uh, computational methods, something really related to experimental uh, setting and how to deal uh, with multimodal data, and then this other completely different uh, topic. Uh, this relates to the fact that CIMEC is an interdepartmental but also interdisciplinary uh, center. And yeah, exactly. uh, so the, the point is that open science and interoperability between data sets is the only way to make these people uh, talk together. Uh, so I think uh, that's that's exactly the one of the points of, uh, of uh, the to take advantage of, the, advantage of the features of the research center. Thank you, and uh, you know, thank you for inviting us, organizing the, this is a, especially a great opportunity to talk about this project we've been working on the past couple of years. It's not something that our lab usually does because usually Yuri most, Yuri's lab mostly talks on molecular biology, but these strongly focus on behavior and it's slightly different from what, this, what you've seen today because Today, we've mostly talked about data reuse, but in this case, we don't reuse data. We took an open source method and uh, from that created an open source method that can be used by other people to sort of standardize behavioral analysis in rodents. So it all starts from this. I mean, Darwin said this about 150 years ago, and the idea is that to study emotion, you can read uh, animals, including human, body language and understand what they are uh, experiencing internally. And this is uh, this is regularly done in rodents. They are an elective model to study uh, emotion-driven behaviors because you know their life depends on fear and anxiety. Um, and it, it has been done in multiple ways. Like a classic way is with Pavlovian fear conditioning. And what you can do is, is to analyze the time the animal freezes after a uh, uh, noxious uh, stimulus. Um, this is very robust and very much used, but usually use a second time indicator, which is the time of immobility and not exactly what the animal is doing. Uh, there are other ways to study um, animal emotions. Another one is in general, read the body language to see what the animal is doing. Like in this case of aggressive behavior, you can see how the body of the animal completely changes and it's a sign of aggression. Um, now the problem when you do this is, as I said, for uh, for fear um, for fear condition for freezing, you use a second indicator. For other cases, what you do is you rely on like pathological observation, which means subjective judgment. 
Now, I don't have to tell you how much this is a problem when we talk about, well, especially open science, right? Because if I'm doing a subjective judgment, then the person I'm training is going to do a different kind of judgment. But even I, if I reanalyze the same video 10 times, I probably get 10 different results, right? So how do we standardize this? Well, until now it was very, very complicated, but now thanks to computer vision and AI, there are tools that allow us to do that in an unbiased way. So one of these tools is called Deep Lab Cut. Most of you probably have heard of this. It's um, an AI-based open source software that what does, you can train it to recognize specific key points in the animal uh, body. When I say animal, it means any kind of animal. This works with human or with mice, anything. Um, the neural networks learn the key point and recognizes them on a frame by frame basis. So in every frame of your videos, you have exactly where the position of these key points in space. Here you see an example of what happens. This is the, on top you see the real videos, and then you see this 3D virtual space where you actually track the points of interest. Now we conceptualize our pipeline using these specific key points because we know that they follow you know, the mouse midline. They are easily trackable from a stereo configuration of the cameras and you never miss them because if you have two cameras from both sides you can always see them but also they basically describe most of what we would consider the variability in the animal spread of behaviors at least thus far i'm sure that with ai we will get more and it already happened to some extent so the question with with this software is once you have the coordinate space what are you doing with it and this is something that is um, creating a little bit of problem into the scientific community because if I'm in my lab and I write my own pipeline and then I don't share it, then I get results that are all in mine and I'm not necessarily what another group is doing in another place. So um, at the beginning, we started developing what I'm going to be showing you, but we realized, well, this would be really helpful for other people, but would be also helpful conceptually to have a tool that standardize this kind of analysis across labs. Um, uh, I should be saying that this is not the only tool, this is the one we developed, we just published, but there are others, so it's up to people to choose, but at least you can say, this is what I use, and theoretically the result should always be the same if you use the same tool. Um, so what did we do with the coordinates that we get out of this tracking software? Well, we went through, oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Um, simply using MATLAB, we, we wrote a uh, two-step cluster analysis that basically takes frame by frame the position and space of, of uh, the body coordinates. First, identify meaningful posture, meaning that they explain the totality of the variance in the animal movement. And then we reconstruct behavioral model, meaning um, basically bucket in which we collect multiple postures that are similar enough that they are probably explaining the same kind of behavior at the time. And we, we believed when we achieved this uh, segmentation that this could be helpful to predict you know, animal behavior re in real time on a frame by frame basis. The advantage of having, that's why I put it here like you know, a single frame, the, the advantage of having a single frame is that you can choose the frame rate of your acquisition and you can decide how much are you sampling on the hand of the, the ongoing behavior. And this can be going for minutes, hours, however long you want. Um, the main point was to validate uh, the method before releasing it online. So uh, what we did, we put, uh, I'll say this very briefly because it's some point of today, but we put in parallel two different conditions. One is a simple open field, so the animals put in, a, in an arena and it's free to navigate the space. And then we, someone is trying to enter the room, I have, Welcome. Ah, good. Uh, yeah, so I was saying that the, we use a control condition where the animal is free to navigate the space. We call this open field. I mean, it's, it's very widely used. And then we parallel it with another condition where there are three minutes of free navigation and then three minutes of sham simulation, meaning that we introduce a stimulus, in this case, a wooden stick, but we don't uh, touch the animal directly. And then there are three by three minutes, so three sessions of three minutes of actual whisker simulation. The whisker are, you know, the, the little 
mustaches that the mice have to explore the environment. Of course, at the beginning, they don't like it and they start liking and exploring. We know this from like previous studies. Um, but our point was to show that when you parallel these two conditions and you analyze with our pipeline, you do see the difference between them. Like in the open field, we basically see a, a blank sheet. Nothing has happened. The, the behavioral module that we identify don't change over the course of the test. While when you, you introduce the simulation that is exactly here, the point of sham, and then the, the stimulus session, uh, <laughs> I didn't know it was a touch screen. <laughs> Surprise. Um, you do see the behavior changing drastically. Um, the other important point here is, okay, I can see that if I stimulate or simulate, I see a difference. This is kind of, it's almost trivial in a way, but does this difference mean something, you know, um, ethologically? So to test this is fairly easy to do. You do the usual, you know, manual point observation of subjective judgment. You, you come up with your own like personal data and then what we did, quantify three specific categories. One is the mouse start trying to avoid the stick. Second one is freezing. So this retracting behavior that they do when they're trying to avoid but not escaping. And then explorative behavior when they rear on their uh, high limbs and they try to interact with the object. And, uh, and then we ask, you know, what we quantify manually does associate with what our pipeline is uh, is assessing and the answer is obviously yes. And uh, what is very striking from this uh, from this uh, heat map is that you see that the, the trends are completely reversed for um, curious driven behavior or anxiety driven behavior, where you see a high correlation with, uh, for example, anxiety driven behavior, like in this case of behavior module number one, you see a negative correlation with anxiety and positive correlation with curiosity and vice versa, for example, for behavioral model number four, when you see positive correlation with anxiety and negative with um, curiosity. So the system works, the, we were pretty excited about this and we decided to publish and release it um, for reproducibility. And uh, here's just an example of one specific behavioral module, the number eight, which we found mostly associated with passive avoidance behavior, you can see that if we try to sniff a single frame that the pipeline has identified, it does correspond exactly to a freezing behavior. And the temporal trend across the triads matches between manual and automated segmentation. Um, last but not least, we also ask, you know, does this have some biological relevance? Because we know pretty much where to go look for anxiogenic response within the brain. So, we we use an immediate allergen, so an activity indicator on the postmortem tissue of on the, of these animals. And what we found is that <clears throat> if you take an animal, there is a high responder, meaning that he's doing a lot of anxious behavior, so a lot of freezing, which is identified as behavioral module number eight. I keep doing this. Um, you see a higher activation than if you take another one that has very low. <clears throat> has very low uh, response with freezing. So this is obviously statistically certified by positive correlation of amygdala activation in uh, <clears throat> with behavioral module number eight and negative correlation with behavioral module number six, which was actually associated with curious, curious uh, behavior. Um, in conclusion, with, uh, with SEB3R or SABER, as I like to call it, uh, we achieved this sub-second fragmentation of uh, mouse body language, and we identified behavioral module that can change drastically in response to a stimulus, the function as a proxy for ethologically relevant behavior that are uh, precisely mapped within some brain circuits. And the idea is now that this code is available on these multiple resources, we, we are aiming to have these reused by other people, further validated, although we run many different trials and the results are always the same, so they're very consistent. We also provide online uh, the validation data, which contains the original uh, deep lab cap files and the output that we have generated. So every person can 
take the data, run them through the pipeline, see the output and compare with what we got and you know check that everything works the way we have described in the paper, which is listed here. Um, this just came out a couple of months ago, maybe less. So we still have to see how much will be used. What we what I would like to do uh, next, if possible, is find a way to also share the tracking videos, like the videos directly, because it happens immediately after the publication that someone, I think at NYU, emailed me personally asking for the video because they're trying to use different models to standardize you know, video analysis, et cetera. So, we're trying to think about that. It's a little bit more complicated in a way, not only for a matter of space, but also, you know, um, that's where you get can get additional data. So also copyright, et cetera. Um, last, I would like to thank the lab, especially, you know, Yuri for giving me the chance to basically independently run this study that is a little bit far from, you know, the goal of the labs for the most part, Tommaso Pekia, uh, the lab manager of animal cognition and neuroscience lab who has helped have with all the technical implementation and special thanks goes to our remarkable animal care facility staff without which none of these would happen. Uh, thank you for your attention. Yeah, so questions? Also from the mod? But we might find out something more maybe at the beginning, but regarding the tracking uh, software, did you download it from it? It was already existing or did you write it? No, no, no. This is this is already existing, this complete like open source available and uh, everybody can use like the Achian lab has a GPU to run it, like dedicated to this software. Um, it can run on any laptop, yeah. But is uh, you know, it requires a lot of effort, yeah. so it's better to have a GPU yeah. to do it or you know, connect remotely to use it. So then, that is something has been like generated and provided years ago. I think the the article for it, um, there was a 2018, yeah, 2018 2019. Yeah, they keep updating. They there, there is another new version that came out recently. So. No, this that that is not my doing. I wish I could do that. No, I, I was just to ask, I want just to ask uh, if it works with normal webcam or you need a specific yes, camera. No, any or... kind of webcam, of course. I mean, it's the matter of the better you see, yeah. the more you see. So at the beginning, we started like with a very simple webcam. We tried to play around with it so that we we were able to actually obtain something out of that. At that point, we we went for the full implementation. This, so we we actually bought two cameras that, um, in this case, they have the feature that basically they work in very low uh, light condition, which is better for the animal because mice are nocturnal. So it can work with anything, but my suggestion is, you know, if you're putting yourself through all of these, then do it with good cameras. But uh, you trained the algorithm to recognize exactly the this point. This point, code. yes. This, so, this you, you give them a batch of image with spinal cord. To yes. So the, the way it works is that you can choose or the 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 program the software does it by yourself. You can just snip some snapshot of of the videos that you have if you have like 10 or 100 videos, you can do it on all of them. The more you use, the better, obviously. And then uh, uh, you have to manually label at the beginning and then train on that. It is the, it's the time consuming part, but that's that's why we use a, a system like this where the cameras are in place and the arena is in place and not moved. So you train one neural network and then you use it forever. Uh, so we, we've trained it on 10 animals and has worked perfectly with all the like hundreds that we did after. And then uh, just I uh, uh, lost this part for the uh, the feature used for the classification of the the actually the the behavior uh, the feature are um, uh, unsupervised so are, are, are not handicapped it's 
So mm -hmm. the, this part, you mean the, the identification? Yeah. So these are, um, I'm calling it same supervised for this reason. I can tell you exactly how it is. I mean, the paper is available, so you, you can read it there, but the way it works is the first step is completely unsupervised. So we use we use an elbow method to pick up the posture that more meaningfully, and this, you know, this is the point of this graph, more meaningfully explain the variance. And then from that, we'll have a number of animals in which we have identified a different number of postures. At this point, we need to recollect them in something that is um, like translatable across animals to do comparison. In that case, you are asked to choose how many behavioral modules you want in the end. So this is where the, the camera resolution can be in, because probably if you have, like we, we noticed that when we switched cameras, we added three or four modules simply because we were seeing more posture to begin with. Um, so in that part, you have to choose the number and obviously this change the data, but there is, there is a principle there. And the principle is that um, behavioral module should be as much as possible replicated across uh, subjects. So if you choose four and you see that one animal basically has four and another has, and most of them has one, then something is not going on. So you do this by iteration, if possible. I mean, at this point, we we have noticed that the, the pipeline usually identified between nine and 11. Um, then some, some of them might have to be uh, deleted because you pick up, you know, 30 frames over hundreds, thousands. So obviously that's not, that's not realistic. Um, but the idea is at some point you you end up that each animal in your group is represented for each of the behavioral modules. Therefore, you can compare them. Can the method use like uh, points, like graph, or, or use because you elaborate the, the points? So yes. again, you have rich image. You have not an image, but you have a sequence of points. Yeah, in a in a, so in technically then actually that yeah put the. The, the useful output of, of the tracking is an Excel file with the coordinate X, X Y, Z. And from, yes, and from the end, also you have a report of like how accurate is that tracking. If you have trained the net, network for enough, usually the, the accuracy is like close to 100%, except some exceptional cases. Um, one thing I didn't go into because it was a little bit technical and maybe not interesting is that of course you can't use the coordinates directly because every animal is different size especially male and female are completely different size so what we do we don't use the the the, the coordinate themselves but we, tr we transform them by subtracting each one to one another so everything is scaled by the total amount by the total mouse size and we have results from these pointed out supplementary slides. Oh. You see that basically there is no difference in males and females in the number of, uh, of modules that are identified here and here in either of the condition that tells us that we have scaled the, the, the size of the animal. Normalize the data. Yeah, basically on, on the animal size. So that posture is identified within the animal size. Oh, I have a, another question. Uh, Gabriele, uh, nice work. I wanted to ask you oh, whether okay. you uh, could use, uh, I mean, it seems to me that you've completely discarded the information about time in this work. And so I have uh, two questions. Like one question is whether including temporal relation between, you know, the tracking of the animals could improve the classification of posture itself. And the second thing is whether you've looked at the science behind this, like for instance, is there, it, I mean, you could look right at whether there are some states that can only be preceded by other states or like, you know, there must one go from being from freezing to exploring happily, right? Like whether you, you, you've looked into using this data to draw so of course, a relationship between states. So um, I'm sorry, I understood the first question, but the second, like literally, I didn't, I couldn't hear because the voice is a little bit. Uh, sorry. So the, the second question is whether you looked at the temporal relation between 
the behavioral states, right? So to try to understand whether there are not just some, there isn't just the patterning of behavior, but there's also patterning of the temporal order of behaviors. Like for instance, mice will freeze and then always start doing something else, you know? So that, that is a, an excellent point, of course. Uh, I mean, globally, the time dependency is here, but is uh, globally meaning by uh, test session, which is obviously very limited. And now, um, for the purpose of today, I removed the slide where I talk about like, there was a raster plot showing every single uh, frame identified and how that can be used exactly for what you're saying. So yes, we, we have done some of it. We've not gone into the details of it because uh, it wasn't necessarily useful to us in this particular context. But you know, I agree with you that that is one of the goals, especially because if you consider this data, you know, this data is done sacrificing the animal like two hours after the simulation, and then you see EEG. But with what you're saying, you could actually try to see if there is some causality between the activation of one area and the manifestation of one of the modules. Uh, does that sort of answer? I mean, it doesn't answer your question because the slide isn't here, but um, but that's what you wanted to hear. So yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. and uh, you do you have another one that I didn't get. Yeah, the other one is whether you think you, I mean you can improve your model that classify postures yeah. by including the information of time, right? You can imagine that if the model is undecided in one frame. You know, because the posture is borderline, but the posture is, you know, between two frames where, you know, clearly the mouse is rearing or whatever, then you, by including the temporal relationship be between, uh, between frames, you could actually help the classification. Because it's very unlikely that a mouse would, would for instance, you know, just freeze for like a, a thirtieth of a second, you know, and so yeah, it would be and, likely that the frame is actually belongs to the rear. Exactly. So this, this is another component, but it, this is a, actually a broader conversation. And we had this with a couple of people at, you know, Chimeka, Yeti. The point would be to add additional classifiers. So one, it's time. One would be, uh, for example, tracking more uh, key points. So there's a number of things that were actually in to work. Uh, then we decided to wrap this up and, you know, send the first paper out, at least to have the code out there and see feedbacks. But if it was up to me, which is not necessarily the case at this very moment, yes, I would go in that direction that you are saying. Um, do we have another comment about this? No, I mean, this is, this is mostly what I can tell you now. Cool. Um, in, uh, in fact, uh, what, what we also tried to do with Luigi, um, Luigi Petrucco, is, uh, is try to see if we can use a P PCA to uh, sort of reclassify the models, right? To identify if there is a pattern. And there was really one main PCA uh, explaining most of the variance. Now, if we take that as a single um, variable, then we could um, add time information. We could add other part of the bodies without like adding too many permutation to what kind of analysis you're doing and see more things with less effort. Does that make sense? Sure, yeah, we can, of course, discuss the details more in person. Yeah, 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 I, I can't talk to you. Good stuff. Thank you.